Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. So shall we start? Yeah, I'm okay. A very good afternoon for all the connected for the first event under the CSI Computer Society of India MIET student chapter. I, Dr. Swati Sharma, welcome all the dignitaries, resource person, and participants. We are fortunate to have with us Professor Arun Sahu, Principal Scientist, Indian Agriculture Research Institute. Mr. Gaurav Goswami, DevOps Engineer, IBM Bangalore. HODs of all department, faculty members, and students. So the world is moving from traditional agriculture methodologies to modernized techniques of farming, resulting in the techniques of farming. Integration of agriculture with technology is a widely growing area. And seeing its great demand, we have selected the topic of today's webinar, Use of AI in Agriculture. Before I hand over the session to our honorable resource person, I would be very happy to share their brief profile. Professor Arun Sahu is presently working as Principal Scientist at Indian Agriculture Research Institute, New Delhi. He has more than 21 years of experience in research, teaching, and capacity building in remote sensing. He has more than 250 publications in national and international journals. Dr. Sahu has been honored with a number of awards, to name the few. He was awarded with President Appreciation Medal by Indian Society of Remote Sensing 2018, Aryabhat Samman of Vigyan Bharti 2013. And another resource person, Mr. Gaurav Goswami, he is presently working as DevOps Engineer at IBM ISL Bangalore. Now, I would like to hand over the session to our Professor Arun Sahu, sir. Please, sir. Sahu, sir. हेलो साहु सर सर मेरी आवाज आ रही है हेलो 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 उनका माइक ऑफ एन माइक ऑन करें अच्छा अच्छा ओके
all the attendees attendees please wait sir is joining again Let me put my video off and uh, I'll share. Uh, please uh, enable the sharing of the screen. Oh, it shows host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, so your screen is not visible. Just a It is visible now, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. So, again, uh, I must thank to the team at MIT for giving this opportunity to talk on AI in agriculture. But before that, I would like to uh, do a little modification on the title itself is sensors and sensing and data analytics for fish and agriculture. You know, for AI, you need uh, to generate huge data. And for that purpose, what are those sensors and sensing we do? So that will give an overview of how potential in India with respect to all these technologies. 
And since this is a student gathering, I thought of uh, uh, being an expert on remote sensing and spectrometry. I thought of uh, I should highlight some of those initiatives done in the country and how huge is the data with respect to the, uh, these tools and techniques and how AI can help us. So since we are talking of agriculture and you are thinking of agriculture should be an industry. So there are a lot of uh, unique challenges what we have. And those are listed over here. And uh, I think many of us uh, know it and also experience day-to-day -day life, how difficult is agriculture to make it an industry. So uh, you must be hearing about the industry 4.0 and now is industry 5.0. So if you think of uh, industry 4.0, which introduces cyber physical system, that's a new term which uh, uh, have been used in industry uh, for so many uh, period of time now, um, um, which uh, deals with uh, process optimization, digital transformation, data analytics, automation, and new business model evolving skill set in needed. So it's nothing but it's a kind of a uh, cyber is all your uh, system, is your IT, and physical is any entity like your computer, your target is your crop or your car or any industry related information. Then how to build up that together into a system. So the cyber physical system is nothing but the communication, computation and controlling of those system for efficient monitoring. So till now we have a common belief that productivity is function of all those inputs we use in agriculture. So that's what written here. But with time changes, now the term we call it, <coughs> sorry. No, call it smart agriculture or Christian agriculture, which is productivity is function of information, optimization, and pace. I'll just take a minute, I'll stop the noise coming from the background. So uh, this is what the revolution with time, wow, the computing revolution has taken place. And uh, now where is time? So uh, going back to 60s and 70s, you had mainframe computing, next is desktop computing, then ambiguous computing, and now is cyber physical system. So accordingly, you can see the industry 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and now it is 4.0, and I think with time now it is going to be 5.0. So that's what is going to happen. And now, you now that cyber physical system for agriculture as industry 4.0, we have named them as cyber agrophysical system. And how and what we need for cyber agrophysical system is the sensor innovations, IOTs, in Internet of Things, as well as sensor network, data integration, and their efficient use, whatever the legacy data we have for agriculture. We have a large number of networked national agriculture system, both in the research institutes and also universities. And many uh, data has been generated through network program. How those legacy data can be used together? And next is how best we can use those big data analytics, using machine learning, deep learning, and artificial intelligence. And of course, how we can develop low cost machineries, robotics mechanotrics and uh, personal fabrication units so that we can make agriculture as, in, as an industry. And again, whatever the data has been generated, how quickly we can take a decision and how we can transform using a new way of communication 
uh, innovations, uh, service science, that's called agriculture extension, how we can use, potentially use the mobile network. So this is what we are looking forward to use this cyber agrophysical system where the big data analytics is going to play a big role. So coming back to precision agriculture, the young students, they know what do you mean by precision. So how precisely you are going to manage your agriculture, that's what the precision agriculture. And it depends on how is the variability when you go across the field, when you go um, along with the time scale and you go with the years to year. And so those variability is captured those variability is because of inherent uh, soil or land properties, because of the management, the way you do the managing the field, and also the way the weather operations of the environment happens. So how best we can manage those, how best we can capture those variable data and put them together so that we can make optimize the yield. So to capture all those variables, you need the sensors, you need the sensors in the ground, sensors in the air, sensors in the satellite. So you look at the left hand side, the picture, how in a four hectare land, how the variability is. And you can think of the kind of variability remains when you go in a district level, village level or the national level. So how to capture those variabilities and put them together and make it a homogeneous zones to address site specific management through optimum production. That's what the precision agriculture means by. And coming back to the sensors, the basic remote sensing, basic physics behind it, it's all you are engineers, you know, basic physics in your school time. So what is that imaging system? Uh, till now, whatever the satellites, whatever the sensors we have, they have been divided in three regions. One is the optical, one other is thermal, another is microwave, where the basic physics is based on the reflectance, based on the emissivity or thermal uh, brightness temperature, based on the backscattering and dielectric constant of the properties. So how, based on these, all those satellites, almost whatever up in the sky, how those data can be retrieved, uh, reliably the information and put them together to generate a map. Then coming back to the another part of the sensor, since I'm going to cover quickly all those sensors, what we have till now. So you have a panchromatic sensors, a black and white sensor, like you have a thermal sensor or black and white picture you can see here in Gate of India. And if you divide them into different uh, spectral channels, blue, green, red, you will get a RGB image. And if you can divide it into number of small channels, then you can get wonderful pictures. Within the blue, there is a variation within green, within red, that variation is there. So technically, they are called panchromatic, multispectral, and hyperspectral. So over the years, the sensor technology has gone from black and white to color to now high density, hyperspectral imaging. The purpose is the basic physics behind it, as I told you before slide, is the unique interaction which takes place with the target, with the, the sense, the, with the target with the electromagnetic radiations, how narrowly I am able to capture. The interaction takes place in the blue band is altogether is going to be green band. Even if in the green band also there is a lot of variations because of the biochemical compositions of physical entity in the target itself. The target may be soil, may be built up, may be water, may be vegetation, may be anything. So how quickly, how, in that narrow spectral range, I am able to capture the data. So this is what the hyperspectral means by, and uh, this is how the beneficial coming back to the panchromatic multispectral. Then what are the possible applications we have in agriculture with respect to the sensors? Just quick view to tell you the multispectral, hyperspectral, thermal, or microwave, mostly for the capturing the variability, soil health, soil fertility parameter, and also crop health, crop uh, monitoring, maybe nutrient stress, but water monitoring, uh, temperature, all those things. So if you look at all those sensors, the basic purpose is how we can put them, uh, sensor derived the data uh, into information, then to knowledge, then to wisdom. So this is how, and you have a repetitivity with respect to all those sensors, what you have on, up in the sky. So having that time scale data and over the years, you can really generate a wisdom like what a, the farmer is having. So similar kind of information you can generate over the years, and you can put them together in an environment called GIS and make them interactive. And you can give a decision rules where which kind of soil has, uh, the plant has to be grown, where what to be done. All those decision making when do provided you have a reliable information for that purpose. So this is what uh, basic concept. And coming back to the AI or data analytics, you can see. The suite of technologies for the solutions nowadays is available. 
So the first is how to acquire the data. Data either by experimental field data, by conventional way, what you have, most of the researchers they do, or by developing apps, or by communication, by mobile connectivity, or by survey, or by sensors. So once you have all those things, you can properly organize them and process them. And that process is here is the help of AI or big data analytics is required. Once you develop them, put them together and integrate them, then you can develop a decision rule, you can create a decision rule, then accordingly you can apply for. So this is what the whole uh, suite of technologies for solution starting from raw acquisition to the endpoint. Then how we capture those data and what are the sensors and sensing methodology we have. So we have starting from the ground, starting from the lab conditions, you can see on the left hand side, the field, either, uh, either putting on a cherry picker, on the drones, and the manned aerial vehicle, then on the satellite. So this is what the level of scale you have, starting from a single picture to regional scale, you have the capability of putting those sensors together. So just give a quick idea, what are those sensors available to ground here? So I won't go in detail, what are those sensors, what are the importance of this, but this tells you, just give you a smell of what are the sensors available, how important it is. So these are the sensors, which are basic sensors for all remote sensing purpose you do. They are very narrow range spectral data it collects in both optical and thermal ranges and you can uh, understand the basic processes and accordingly you can go to multispectral or hyperspectral or to airborne or satellite level. So to do those basic studies, basic understanding how the one plant and other plant is behaving differently because of the change in water content, because of nutrient or anything, all these basic requirements must in the lab conditions. So without doing that, going to the field level or going to a satellite or regional level is going to be meaningless. So to do all those basic studies, research, this instrument is very much important. And you can think of the kind of the data it generates. Uh, that instrument, the spectrometer you see down here, all those three are spectrometers, is huge data which is generated over the time. A single scan, which takes hardly 10 seconds, it creates 2,151 data points. So you can think of how many data we have been collecting over the years for the soil, plant, and all those things. So what I mean to say is I just wanted to give a feeling how huge is the database, what we have, what the challenge we have. Now, again, there's another kind of census. What we have is, I'm not going in detail of the, the term used here. The phenomics is another research for what we do in agriculture. So we have a control conditions where we put all the sensors, and this is what the phenomics facility what we have here. It's a wonderful facility. All is kind of like going to a hospital, or going to a diagnostic lab where you have all imaging stations, you get into there, do a PET scanning, do an X-ray, do a CT scan. At the end of the day, you come to the doctor to analyze what the problem with you and he diagnoses you and prescribe you what kind of treatment you have to go for. So it's a, something like that. So you have different imaging platforms where the plants goes in and capture the data. Images are captured and goes back and we take the decisions based on that. So this is what the control conditions, same we have in the field where we put all these frames, put the sensors to move around. And again, also we have drones. And these are all kinds of sensors what we use over here. And this is a small movie. I don't know whether you will be able to see that. So, just to tell you about it. <laughs> अनुसंधान संस्थान ने एक अत्यधुनिक एवं स्वचालित प्लांट फिनोमिक्स केंद्र की स्थापना की है। फिनोमिक्स ई का आधुनिक बहुविषयक विज्ञान है, जिसमें लगभग वास्तविक समय में पौधों को बिना क्षति पहुंचाए सेंसर्स एवं कंप्यूटर की सहायता से लक्षण प्रारूपण किया जाता है। ये केंद्र हाईटेक नियंत्रित जलवायु वाले ग्रीनहाउस, गतिशील फील्ड कन्वेयर सिस्टम, स्वचालित भारोत्तोलन, उर्वरक एवं सिंचाई स्टेशन और विभिन्न इमेजिंग सेंसर से सुसज्जित है। ये केंद्र जलवायु अनुकूल फसल किस्में विकसित करने के लिए उपयोगी श्रेष्ठ जीन प्रारूपों एवं जीनों की पहचान करने के लिए so this is what the facility what we have. And these are all possible sensors. And next movie it tells you the, the uh, movie clip of inauguration by Honorable Prime Minister. So I just keep because of the time constraint. So what I mean to say over here is you have a different kind of sensor, different imaging platform, and how 
those observations can be retrieved into information, then you can go for predictive science. What is going to happen if at all this plant is grown under these conditions? So those are all predictive science we try to do using all those big data analytics. So you can think of the kind of data we have generated over the years till 2019. It is around 36 million images which has been created with the different sensors. And till now, if we put them together, it's going to be 52 million images which has been generated over the years. So it's a huge data which has been created and all the curated level which can go into all those big data analytics purpose. And next is, so this is our ground facility what we have. Next is your, nowadays your drone is very common in every uh, startup and uh, company uh, issues, how potentially you can use them. So uh, you can see these are the all possible sensors what we have because of time. So these are our own sensors which go in the, which we are able to take up in the field and capture the data, our own uh, external field to capture them. So and these are all possible sensors which we try to use. And the reason is what we do in the ground level using a one single plan, we are doing it in a larger scale and quick. And that too, again, real time data availability, low data cost, high spatial resolution. Then you can change the sensors, whatever you have, anytime you want. And very simple format, you can generate that type kind of data. So and these are all advanced sensors what we have. And this is again one of the advanced sensors which we are trying to do it. Um, uh, that's called hyperspectral sensor. So then going from the uh, drone to airborne, this is again a very ambitious science campaign which was done in collaboration with NASA and ISRO. And uh, there are many institutes partnered in that and IRE was leading, you know, one of the leading institutes for agriculture applications. So uh, this is a very ambitious sensor which is of uh, JPL NASA, which is integrated with our Indian flight of you know, NRSC National Remote Sensing Center and flown all around the country and generated. This is what the uh, details of where IARU was involved and gone in the ground truth collections with in collaboration with many institutes together. And this is what the uh, sensor and this is what the flight and the kind of data we generate in the field is starting from 400 to 2500. It's huge data. One scan of four kilometer width with 10 kilometer length is something around 100 GB and it's around 270 channels it creates together. Then coming back to the aerial survey till now what ISRO has been doing, you can think of 1969 till now 2017. So many missions has been taken place just to understand capability of those sensors for different applications so that we can go for a satellite level. And uh, these are so many missions we have created over the years. Uh, ISRO is one of the uh, number one with respect to the space missions and capability with respect to agriculture and different natural resource management. Technically, with respect to spatial resolution, temporal resolution, and spectral resolution, this is the ISRO has developed its own the best technology till now what in the world is having. Then looking back to the 50 years of remote sensing and that experience with respect to IRA. So the remote sensing in country started sometimes in 1969. And now in 2019, this is what the celebration we did, 50 years of celebration. So we started with coconut wool disease somewhere in the Kerala. And this is what 2018, I showcased you how in collaboration with NASA again, we started with. What I have to say is over the years, how the technology has moved up. This is simply black and white picture movie, what you have seen, Raja Hari Chandra, the past movie, black and white movie. This is something like that, what you made, you have a coconut plantations and fields. And this is the same field where you have very high resolution data, multispectral and hyperspectral data to characterize not only the plant and also plant based on diseases and many other things. So this is what the technological advancement which has been taking place. So till now what I talked about is the sensors and sensing how it does. Now coming back to the big data analytics, I think being in the computer science disciplines, you know, many of those, these are all uh, approaches which you usually use. Till now, when we have been student, we have been using univariate simply empirical model approach, regression model approach. With time, the multivariate approaches has come, means y is function of number of x. So how you can do, these are all different techniques which have been done. Then with time, after multivariate statistical model, we started using machine learning. That is what support back to machine learning forest, ANN came up. So when I was in PhD, ANN, that was the first question which I gave in my statistical institute. 
show application in image classification. Then next is coming up the deep learning. So you being in computer science, you understand what are the basic differences between deep learning, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. And when you go for a deep learning, you see the kind of size of the data, what is required, and kind of the performance, what is going to be done. So it's a deep learning, a machine learning, or artificial, artificial intelligence is nothing but it's the model of model automatically does those kind of understanding. So when you had a machine learning, you see you have a um, uh, septrons, you have a neurons, uh, the functions here. You have an input layer, you have an output layer. One of the hidden layer is here, where you take a decision, a sequence function you can use and go for that. But in the case of deep learning, you have so many layers of the uh, decision making layers so that it go more deep in thinking and coming out with what you report. So this is what, in, just in brief, tells about those uh, purposes. Now coming back to the, some of the applications, what we try to do is, what about the huge data we generate in the plant phenomics facility using those 52 million images? We try to put them together systematic way, develop the pipelines to characterize how those plants are behaving for different purposes, so that we can go for um, uh, uh, enhancing the productivity and better gene and variety for different uh, conditions. This is again, you, you have seen some, one of the sensor called hyperspectral, how to analyze that data. So in-house we try to develop our own program like this. You can not only characterize with broad spectral data, also you can characterize using many uh, multivariate models and also machine learning and deep learning tools. Again, whatever the data we've thrown over the drone, so how we can use them together quickly, morning you fly them and evening you can see how quickly you are able to there. So this is what the raw data you generate in the field and come out with some kind of a remote sensing uh, derived indices. And finally, you generate a product like chlorophyll like this. So this is what the, and behind all those multivariate, univariate models are there. Again, to some of those are in using machine learning. Then coming back to the, all these tools, whatever the data analytics, sensing, how best we can use them for different purpose, precision agriculture, that's what I'm going to tell you about here. Just to quickly to tell you, whatever the data collected in the lab, lab conditions, you are able to see them. Those instruments which you could see in the lab conditions, how we are able to predict different soil properties. And these are the prediction models, which is evaluated in terms of statistical parameter called R square and RPD. How we can use them to come out with those prediction models for all those soil health? So if at all it is possible, then this is going to be a complement for soil health card program. That's what we are actively involved with ministry and many other institutes, how best we can use this capability of the sensors and also data analytics to come out with the uh, models. Then if it is possible, then how we can go back into a satellite level. This is a satellite somewhere in the regions. And you are able to predict from the lab conditions to the field conditions to the satellite level, how you can predict different uh, soil parameters and generate the map like this. Then uh, these are our different machine learning programs which has been used, uh, support by machine, Mars, and also multivariate models like PLH, so that you can generate a map like this. So this is what the airborne campaign, which is done by NASA. This is somewhere in Raichu, Karnataka, where each pixel size is three meter and it's three kilometer height of the, that was flying. And this is what the crop classified again using SVM. And this is a soil area which have those you are able to see here. This is soil crop area is masked out, and this is soil organic carbon map which is generated again using machine learning programs. Then quickly, this is what the digital soil map again a new concept coming up uh, worldwide. If you have a satellite data, multiple satellite data, then within no time you should be able to in a cultivated field you will be able to get organic carbon available P and available K. These are some of the research effort we are trying to do how it is doing, how we are able to do. These are all science behind because of the time constraint. I won't be able to deliberate more in detail about that. But our purpose saying over here is you have a huge data which is captured by the sensor. How best we can use those data in indirectly generate some of the indicators of the soil health or soil fertility parameter, doing some of the machine learning programs and come out with a, a regional scale fertility mapping. And once you generate a fertility map of an area, then you can put them together. For example, these different colors you see of a canal district of uh, Haryana, those says low, medium, high, 
of the organic carbon, phosphorus, and potassium. And you put them together in a GIS environment, you get a homogeneous unit generator like this. And once you generate it, then you can go for a modeling. If at all this is a nutrient status, what should be the, my recommendation of the fertilizer? This is what we do the fertilizer recommendation. So whole Karnali study has been divided into eight homogeneous units and accordingly you can go for nutrient applications. This is what the customized fertilizer you can do. And same thing we try to extrapolate to a larger scale called uh, transganglion plane and we could generate all cropping system again using time series satellite data, again supported by cremation and random forest classification. And we are able to generate for different crop what should be the recommendations. Same also with respect to pest and disease, you must have heard there are many startup companies, Pantix and many others, who are using AI techniques for just simply uh, capturing the image, they are able to say what kind of pest and disease. But of course, here we are not using simply RGB, we are using hyperspectral data, how they are behaving, the spectral signatures with respect to different stress levels, and you are able to capture them and predict uh, whether rice brown plant hopper can be predicted and if it is what is the severity level so that you can go for management same also yellow rust this is what we have done a long back and same also we are done uh, last year only we did with the rice blast so now coming back to the drone part you can see this is what the experiment we have in the field you can see some of the fields are remaining fallow because they are all early variety which got harvested and this is what the drone data which is captured and uh, stitched together and overlay over the google earth and you can see the kind of sensors we try to use with the difference of treatment of drought, irrigated nitrogen, and so many genotypes grown over there and you are able to capture those data. And once you capture this data, how you can come out with the reliable information, this is what it tells you. For example, simply index we take, called normalized difference radius index. Those who are remote sensing background, they can understand, forget. Whatever the data from there, we develop an indicator. And from that indicator, you are able to see differential treatment of drought, irrigation, and nitrogen or nitrogen zero, you are able to see the different color that indicates differential response of the field to those treatments. Not only that, within the field also, we have 14 genotypes grown. So how each genotype is behaving at different condition and different time, that is also captured. And once that is captured, so within no time, I don't know whether Dr. Vipa Singh is here with us, uh, it, he will be happy to see that. Within no time, all these are done automatic, automation through that software drone agree. Again, behind is the machine learning and deep learning program is running. So within no time, 100 on 1 to 192 genotypes are mapped together. This color tells you how good those genotypes with respect to that particular treatment we are able to capture. So same also with the thermal remote sensing. This is what the thermal camera flown over a drone and you are able to see the differential response with respect to the canopy temperature and you are able to Again, differentiate the different genotypes what you have. So same thing, just I want to capture. This is the same thing which is given at different days of sowing. And also before harvest, crop is starting, you can go for the biomass yield predictions. And you are able to do the biomass yield predictions, not only for the purpose of yield prediction, also to know if at all there is drought, which genotype is still giving good biomass, good yield, which genotype is not giving, even if healthy conditions. So this is what I am talking with respect to genotype. At that time, you can talk in terms of farmer's field. And this is again for a nitrogen, a differential treatment is given for the nitrogen and you have captured the data. And you see the differential colors you are able to see within no time from a raw image like this, this is what the actual field, this is what the drone captured the image. And this is what the nitrogen map you could generate. And you can see the nitrogen changes, how it takes place. Then next is the water, same, same conditions, same way we have tried to do. So everywhere here, we have used all those machine learning programs only. So this is again 10,000 land races, which has been used uh, using drone. 10,000 all over country, whatever the rice varieties are there, they are grown in the ID field. We are able to capture those data. And if time, uh, I don't know whether you will be able to see this uh, video. Uh, no, sorry, you are not able to see that. Uh, are you able to see that? No. So let me skip that. I'll come back that later sharing a movie file. It's a very big file. So you will feel like if I click on this, in the movie is not running right now. If you click on that, you will feel like as if I'm running in the field itself and able to see the plant, how it is with respect to height and kind of a distribution you can see. This is what all simulation doing through reprocessing and all those things. So whatever the image we capture in the, in the phenomics facility, 
So here you can see all those machine learning programs we are trying to use. So image acquisition, pre-processing, segmentation, feature extraction, and machine learning classifications we try to do. And this is what one of the example I am giving you here. So this is what the deep neural network which has been used. So you got an image where the number of panicles years which is coming out with the grains will come up later. So you can, within no time, you can count them as a using a yellow technique. Nowadays, you capture a photo in your mobile and you are able to get a square box of a face of the person you are taking picture. So behind is nothing but the AI is working. Same technique we try to use here for person that is called you only look once. Then you are able to capture the number of years. And same thing we are trying to do also using simply thresholding and capturing the number of panicles and years and count those grains and go for the yield predictions. And again, number of leaves. These are all important attributes, parameters or traits which we use for discriminating how good is those parameters. Once it is success in the control conditions, the same thing we are going to do in the field conditions. Once it is grown, which variety or which field has come up with the flowering and if at all, or if the number of years has come up, how many are there? And again, the same variety, or same plant standing here, you see the different colors. How those, whatever the data sensor we have, we try to use different indices and to capture how the variability is captured with respect to that. Again, we try to use also edge intelligence. This is again one of my students who very, very recently he did it and just communicated recently for nitrogen stress detections. And this is again some of the areas we have tried to do with the uh, grape growing area in Nasik to uh, minimize the pesticide spray and go for an efficient pistol farming. Uh, and this is again, whatever the air gone data we have done here, we have tried to do machine learning, you know, our chat cross classification is going to be very difficult. You see so many within the field also, you have so many uh, within the mixing uh, plants will be there. But we are trying to do using support of vector machine and support uh, spectral anger mapper. And we are able to do some kind of classification. There's a national program going on called Chaman, where this is going to be a very valuable input to come out with how accurately we can discriminate different orchard crops. Then this is what the, some of the physical models here again, we try to use artificial neural network with genetic algorithm. One said you got a sensor and you got a generated data and from there you can generate all those biophysical parameters generated. So again, I'm not going into detail, I'm rossing because another speaker is waiting for you wonderful talk we are going to hear about. So for example, this is a crop area and wheat crop area, which is done again using time series data of a transgenic plant in Punjab, Haryana, and two districts of Rajasthan. And from there, we are able to derive some of the biophysical parameters. This is again using all those genetic algorithm and AI in person models. We are able to go leaf area index, water content, and chlorophyll content estimations. So these are some of those uh, work which we try to do. And this is what the real time con crop condition monitoring we are doing. We have our own data racing stations. Again, we are trying to use different models, how real time you can come out with the crop condition and race to point. And again, we have different uh, process-based models called simulation models and where you can go for crop condition monitoring and also go for geo-based and also decision rules when what to be done. So this is all about agriculture. Quickly, just to give a one or two slides, I have more. So how precision livestock farming can be done? Again, you can take an image and quickly you can go for morphometric analysis of those plants, how the biomass and all those. This is what the animal phenotyping can be done. And you can put a sensors over the peaks or buffaloes or anywhere or even if uh, poultry, and you can understand their activity, how they are. So uh, you can nowadays, you must have heard of, there are many startups in India itself. I, I, I saw them in two years, three years back in Europe. But it's very common nowadays. You can put a, a earring on the ear of a cow, and within no time, you can know where it is grazing and what is its activity. And you can put a chip on his neck and how good he is with respect to eating habit and bowel movement. So, all those things, the physical and the, the health monitoring of the cow can be done within no time. And eating period of a buffalo or cow is a very important with respect to its productivity. Quickly, using thermal sensors, you can do that. So this is what the health monitoring on simply by sound analysis. That's what the people do here behind is nothing but the, again, all those deep learning programs are used for. So model based monitoring of water use, how best they're using water under, how good they are with respect to health so that they're able to do the watering. 
Then, with respect to the census in agro food value chain, again, starting from harvest to the market, everything is now RFID coded or QR coded. How we can put them together? How we can use the blockchain technologies for that purpose? Again, this is a part of AI which can be used. So finally, what I mean to say is, so you need to capture the data. Data you may capture by your mobile or from a, from a horse mouth, but those data has to be processed, put in together and go for the key deliveries, either for precision farming or decision making or for any research purpose. So here is all, these are all data driven. How could you even with respect to data? How could you even with respect to analytics? That all depends on the success story where you like it. Then what ICT in Indian agriculture, what I am, again, we are leading one of the program in country, AI uh, in country, and one of the AI applications is going to AI in agriculture. So here, so you can think of the potential of ICT in country itself, how potential with respect to so its capability in the country is listed over here. And what is the importance of agriculture, putting them together in ICT framework. And this is what the smart agriculture framework, which we propose to the Niti Aayog and also uh, Ministry, uh, Government of India, is going to be funded in a big way. So how all those informations can be collected from different places and also how all this, they will be benefited. Again, you have a, going to be, have a concept called Airavat, which is going to be owned by uh, Ministry of IT in Maiti, where all those data will be pulled together and all those big data analytics, cloud computing can be put together. Then finally, it will help all the policy makers um, and also the companies and also the farmer for efficient management of the agriculture. That's called smart agriculture. This is what the cloud infrastructure is going to come up with, which is proposed. So thank you very much. And uh, you see the, the work which has been done is because of my uh, wonderful uh, students who have been working with uh, And also now, right now, they have been involved, very actively involved in many deliverables, uh, the recent technology, deep learning AI, and sensor technology for agriculture purpose. And thank you for giving me this opportunity and uh, hear me recently. And I love to interact and uh, go for any questions if I talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing such valuable ideas with us. We will be very happy in future also. Now I request Mr. Gaurav Goswami to continue with the session. Hello, everyone. Uh, we had a great session with Dr. Sahu. Uh, we had a, uh, a couple of nice ideas and um, very knowledgeable things uh, given by Dr. Sahu. So I would like to continue on that topic itself. Uh, um, I would like to uh, spread the information about how can we use these computer technologies uh, in agriculture, right? So we all know uh, uh, like this uh, computer technologies can help, but how? That's the question, right? Now, let me just share my screen. <clears throat> Allow me a second. Is my screen visible? Yes, sir, it's visible. Okay. so. Let's start with the topic, how can computer technologies improve agriculture, right? Now, let's try to understand agriculture first. It's not only about uh, growing plants and uh, seeding seedlings or something like that. Uh, it has a very wide stages. It has a lot of stages, uh, starting with preparation of soil, which means firstly, you will have to check whether the soil is favorable for the plant or not whether the uh, soil conditions, air conditions, and other, uh, whatever factor is responsible for the plants, it, is it favorable for that or, or not? You will have to prepare everything. Then you need to sow the seeds. After that, you need to check for germination. After that, you need to, uh, if, if the plant is transferable, you need to transfer it in the soil or maybe in a wider area where it can, uh, grow well after that you need to uh, uh, irrigate it well 
so there are many stages right so it's not only uh, growing a plant <clears throat> now we need to check what factors are mostly affecting agriculture so we have a lot of factors right we have the temperature profile the wind profile the air moisture content uv radiation the precipitation topography soil nutrients maybe the uh, transpiration of the plant uh, and the soil conditions many of them plenty of them so uh, we need to uh, think so how computer technologies can help in all those factors so using the computer technologies we can uh, i'm just giving an example you can think of ahead of this also uh, i'm just giving you an example we can do the soil monitoring the air monitoring the water monitoring pest and insect monitoring plus protection we can do the crop monitoring the disease detection on demand irrigation fertilization and pesticide spray all these things are being happening or all these things can be done using iot and computer technologies within the agriculture field right now if i take example uh, there's a there's a startup uh, i don't know the name but there's a startup which provides you with a sensor which monitors the soil right it provides you with all the data like what is the temperature of the soil is it favorable for the seed you have grown what is the moisture content of the soil what is the nutrient profile of the soil every data it provides so you can just uh, get it uh, on your mobile phone on your laptop or your or or maybe any uh, any device and after that you can uh, think of what what crop would be favorable for my uh, uh, soil or or how can my how can i improve my soil conditions how uh, what fertilizer should i uh, uh, throw in that so all these things can be done so this was this example for soil monitoring after that you can also do air monitoring now uh, uh, in israel uh, there's a startup uh, which which does this air monitoring system with a, the help of a drone what they are doing they are they uh, they uh, they flying a drone every day within 24 hours and every day recording the uh, air conditions like what is the uh, carbon uh, percentage in the air what is the precipitation in the air everything uh, like that and after that uh, they are doing some research like in what conditions in what air profile conditions the crop is uh, growing faster in what uh, air conditions the crop is getting down or something like that so we can also do that air monitoring system after that we can also monitor the water for the turbidity for the ph maintenance what is the ph is it is it good for my crop or not we can do that also we can use the iot sensors for that uh, you can uh, uh, check the uh, maybe some acid is present in that some uh, uh, adulterant or something like that you can do the water monitoring also and for the pests and insects protection again in israel there's a startup uh, which which uh, which is using the high frequency speakers or i would say uh, like ultrasound speakers are there what they are doing uh, they they're having a pir sensors which detects any of insect or pest whichever comes in contact in your with your crop and whenever it is detected they are activating that ultrasound speakers so using that ultrasound speakers they are they are actually repelling all those insects and pests from a crop right so we can do that also that is also uh, possible with the use of iot now uh, if i say for the crop monitoring you can also monitor the health of your crops the height it has gained the strength is it has gained you can monitor 24/7 what is the status uh, maybe by a camera or something as as dr sahu uh, told us there are plenty of cameras like multi spectral camera sensors or maybe ultraviolet camera sensors near uh, near uv range and like that so we can use that also after that if if i if i say uh, disease detection is also possible that would be also not uh, false if i say that uh, you can just uh, monitor your crop uh, leaves or maybe the stems or maybe something other 
and you can monitor if if any disease is there using the computer vision again um, you can make use of uh, different types of camera sensors and you can also uh, after de detecting a disease you can also work on uh, how it can be resolved if you know the disease you may uh, go for on demand irrigation like instead of watering uh, continuously to the uh, to the crop uh, uh, you can you can make use of on demand irrigation system which means whenever the moisture content of the soil goes down uh, uh, down the point which it requires like if a crop requires suppose uh, 25 mm cube right so uh, if that moisture content goes down that and then that the threshold point you can uh, trigger the uh, your, your water pump you can do that and for the crop disease uh, crop disease detection you can uh, do on demand fertilization or on demand pesticide or insecticide uh, spray on demand fertilization means uh, if the if the soil condition soil nutrient conditions and pk values go lesser than that is required you can also uh, go for on demand fertilization which means uh, you can you can mix uh, uh, fertilizers in this uh, in the water itself or you may uh, spray it on the crops or you may uh, mix it with the soil you have plenty of uh, 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 methods for that and uh, on demand pesticide or weedicide spray is almost uh, is already going on with many of the uh, nations like Uh, again if i say israel israel is also doing this on on demand pesticide and weedicide spray uh, using the unmanned aerial vehicles which is a uh, uh, drone in in a, in a case and now uh, i want to tell you this why should i be concerned or why should you be concerned about this all these things like agriculture is almost uh, is not uh, ended yet in the india and uh, it is people are people are working on their crops and people are doing farming so why should i be concerned or why should you be concerned so i want to show you this graph of india's uh, uh, agriculture's contribution in india's gdp right starting from the financial year 2005 if i say it was around 19% contribution of agriculture in the total gdp and from that point it has been declining to uh in financial year 2012 it was just 14% and just imagine we have only the data until financial year 12 i mean i mean uh, on the online websites we have data until financial year 2012 we may have uh, data for ahead years also but just imagine the rate is it is declining down what will be the future of agriculture in in, in a country like india where we started with only agriculture right so you and me should be concerned about this now what can we adopt or encourage to adopt right uh, we have various uh, methodologies to work with like if i say permaculture permaculture is about uh, giving time to your crops giving time to your fields and making it a permanent ecosystem like uh, suppose i am giving all time it requires i am i am giving i am watering my whole fields and i am watering it in the way that the water goes to the ground level and after 12 years 13 years or maybe uh, lesser if i say maybe 4 years or 5 years after that it is again a permanent ecosystem within itself it doesn't require any uh, rainfall it doesn't require any uh, Uh, fertilizer or something so this is called permaculture but it requires a lot of uh, you know lot of time now we can go for precision agriculture precision again means uh, when you have the data you you can't uh, uh, when you have the data in your hand you can act accordingly because you have all the precision in yourself you know the uh, nitrogen value within your soil you know the moisture value in your soil you know the other nutrient values in your soil you can act accordingly because you know the exact value exact uh, nutrient value that is called precision agriculture or you may go for conservation agriculture conservation means uh, you conserve each and everything you you don't uh, waste any uh, any by product or anything which comes within the uh, agriculture phase like if i say 
when you reap the crop when you harvest the crop some uh, uh, some roots or maybe some stems are uh, like thrown away they are not used you can make use of that uh, by maybe uh, like if i say i i saw a video on permaculture uh, some days back so what they suggested that you can use these stems or something uh, you can uh, cover the soil so that uh, after the harvesting thing your soil doesn't get uh, uh, soaked from the sun sun's light sunlight so it it again has the moisture until you uh, cover it up so you can use it in that way also that is called conservation agriculture if you are saving each and every product now if you ask me if you are not uh, uh, like if you are not convinced yet i can give you a proof like i have been talking about the country israel um, you can search it on google or something israel has been uh, the best producer of uh, plants best producer of fruits and something uh, fruits and all these food products since i guess 3 uh, 5 to 6 years and uh, since 2 3 years the, uh, israel is adopting iot they are having a iot uh, revolution inside their country so you can check this out check this graph uh, this is this graph shows uh, how much export they are doing uh, to the world uh, for the food products Like if I if I if I say in 2012 it was just 2.88 millions, right? It has boomed up in 2015 up to 3.5, and again in in 2017 it was uh, more than 3.63. You can see the difference uh, clearly. Israel has been feeding the whole world with his uh, food products using IoT technologies within the agriculture. so i think this proof is uh, like enough to convince you guys about this now uh, thanks for the patience you have made it to the end and if you have any questions you can ask me or else i'll just uh, stop sharing my screen yeah so any questions all right over to you swati hello ha uh, thank you gaurav sir for the information you have shared i am thankful to the resource person for sharing time for this webinar from their busy schedule and we all at mit are honored to hear you your ideas and experiences in the field of agriculture your suggestion and knowledge shared during the session will surely benefit our students thanks a lot sir thank you thanks guys thank you very much sahu sir and uh, gorav for uh, giving this valuable information and de definitely it will benefited uh, our students to uh, uh, to get some uh, new project idea because uh, the students are doing uh, some traditional software service but uh, now this uh, they are uh, i think from here uh, from this lecture they will change their mind and uh, try to opt or thinking about some uh, agriculture type of thing yeah agriculture project that would be definitely uh, benefit for the society okay thank you very much to uh, to both of you thank you thank you so we can leave now uh yes sir yes sir uh, you can leave now thank you sir
Thank you, students, for joining the session. Okay, thank you.